Hello all, this is Tony Bramley with uh, TMC. Thank you for coming today. We're gonna let everybody filter in and we'll get started in just a minute. Excellent. Well, it looks like people are still kind of filtering in. So uh, give us just one more minute and we'll get started. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for uh, coming to TMC Connect today. We appreciate uh, you being here. We've got an excellent uh, webinar for you today on how to build a scalable and efficient operation through technology and outsourcing, even through a pandemic. Uh, today we have with us uh, Rob Borges and Rajiv Kumar with Flat World Solutions. <laughs> and, I'll leave and, the Rob, mask. and Rob is uh, socially distancing appropriately. <laughs> Can you go to the next slide, Rob? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, shameless plug for our TMC platforms, TMC Connect, which is where you are today, Ask TMC and TMC Benchmark. If you want to know uh, more about the different platforms that we have available, please feel free to talk with your uh, engagement member or uh, check us out on our website. You can go to the next slide, please. And another shameless plug for the 12 days of TMC. This is our uh, virtual event that we'll be having from December the 1st through December the 18th. So please uh, join us for that uh, festive occasion and wear your ugliest Christmas sweater because I'm hearing that there are gonna be some good prizes. So, um, and with us today, um, Rob Borges and Rajiv Kumar, I'm gonna let them uh, introduce themselves um, but once again, just to uh, let you know, this is how to build a scalable and efficient operation through technology and outsourcing, even through a pandemic. So Rob, if you want to go. Sure. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, I'm going to first introduce Rajiv. Um, Ron Howe, who could not be with us today, um, has uh, affectionately named him the doctor of mortgageology. And Tony, I know you like that, uh, that little uh, uh, name that, uh, that we've given Raj. But uh, Rajiv um, uh, really runs uh, all of our almost 2,000 people um, in uh, a couple of sites uh, in, in India and in the Philippines. And uh, Rajiv has, I think uh, he's kind of started this thing up on his own and uh, has about 12 years um, into this uh, in the mortgage business. And uh, I'm uh, joined with uh, Rajiv about a year and a half ago. I'm very, very happy that I did. Um, I've got... Uh, uh, shame, shame to say, 38 years in this crazy <laughs> business and have seen uh, uh, quite a few ups and downs, um, having spent time with, uh, with some large companies um, and, and uh, uh, a, few, a, few, uh, a few smaller companies. So I've, I've been involved in retail, wholesale, and correspondent throughout my career and uh, um, went to the, uh, the, the crazy side of, uh, of outsourcing and automation a year and a half ago. So and I'm very happy to be with all of you. Great, thank um, you so much. Um, Rob, before, you, uh, sure. before we get started, just um, some quick housekeeping things. Um, it, whether you've joined um, via your computer or on a phone, everybody is muted. Uh, that's just to cut down on the background noise and to make sure that everybody can hear the presenters. Uh, but we do want this to be engaging. We want you to um, send your questions in. So if you'll note the uh, Zoom, um, on the bottom of your of your screen, there is a menu and it's got a Q&A or a chat function. So please feel free to add those questions in there. And I'll be uh, reading those off to the, the discussion leaders at the end of the presentation. I um, also wanted you to know that there'll be a follow-up email that goes out tomorrow. Um, it will have instructions on how to access the recording for uh, today's webinar. And once again, we appreciate you being here. 
And Rob, back to you. Great, thanks, Tony. Um, our shameless plug will come toward the end of the presentation. Um, <laughs> uh, in, in all seriousness, uh, folks, um, uh, you know, when we talked with Tony and, and TMC about this, uh, we, you know, we're, we're totally agreeable that we want to make this educational and, and we want to inform. Um, uh, we will do our shameless plug at some point, but we, we really want to inform. Uh, uh, and we may use some examples of, of um, uh, current business that we're doing uh, to, to help with that information. Um, so I'm just going to read something very quickly. Scalability, scalability is a characteristic of an organization system model or function that describes its capability to cope and perform well under an increased or expanding workload or scope. A system that scales well will be able to maintain or even increase its level of performance or efficiency, really important, even as it is tested by larger and larger operational demands. I think that everyone on this call uh, who's been in this business can totally understand that we are under a demand like we've obviously never ever seen before. And the importance of being able to scale your operation both up and down has never been more critical. And we're gonna to talk today about how outsourcing and automation uh, can, help, uh, can help you do that. And I'm, I'm gonna ask my partner Rajiv at any time if I miss anything, which I most likely will do, please step in and, and augment the presentation. So obviously guys, we're in an unprecedented time. I mean, the volumes that we've seen, um, and, and we speak with multiple clients every day about the challenges they're facing, um, requires a, a, an operational capacity expansion that we've never seen before. Then if you combine that with the remote working environment in which we are all under, um, it becomes extremely hot, uh, challenging. Most importantly, hiring good people and then training those people. Um, you know, we have a limited talent pool, uh, especially as, as an example um, in underwriting. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for anyone to find uh, quality underwriters and then they're asking you to pay up uh, you know, pretty significantly. Um, it's, it's an unprecedented time in that uh, regard, as well as other line workers uh, for the mortgage and the lending uh, business. Then if you combine that with the stress that we're facing in, in, a, in a pandemic, the anxiety that we're facing in a pandemic, the limited talent pool, and then just let's add on top of that, that no one really knows uh, when, how long this refi boom and how long this is, this uh, volume is going to, is going to last. Now, before I came to Flat World, I worked with uh, Freedom Mortgage and helped stand up their correspondent uh, group back in 2012. And uh, my boss, Stan Middleman, um, who um, many of you may have heard of and know um, in the industry, um, he thinks that this is going to go through at least the summer into the fall of next year, which gives us about another year's ramp. Others in the industry and clients that we're talking to think it'll, it'll uh, go through to the spring uh, season. But the reality is, and the truth is, we don't really know um, how long this is going to last. When we get to a question and answer period, I would be very interested to hear uh, what, what other folks on this call think about that. So um, how, what, what are the potential solutions for us, not just to manage through this current cycle um, and manage you know, the wave as it goes up and peaks, but also as the wave comes down? Um, outsourcing clearly is a potential solution for many, many clients, many of, many of you out there on this call. Um, outsourcing uh, will help you build not only temporary capacity, but capacity going forward. Um, it also, as we'll, as we'll explore a little bit later, that's as important strategically on the downside of a, of a, of a volume swing or a refi boom, as unprecedented as this is, as well as on the upside of that. Um, automation is another, is another key component and a, another key potential solution uh, that I know we're all exploring. And we, we do have some solutions and some, some things we'll talk about when we do our shameless plug uh, later for automation. Um, and then workflow re-engineering. Um, you know, when I, I, I'm a sports nut, I, I don't know if everybody sees, I, I love Barcelona Cup. And, you know, when you look at teams like Barca's uh, soccer, uh, European football team, um, I'm a Miami Heat fan because I live in South Florida. When you look at Pat Riley and, and when you look at Bill Belichick and you look at some of these really successful teams, 
what they focus on is the process. Um, they believe that if you focus on the process and you get better every day, you're going to win at the end of the day. And workflow re-engineering um, is, is very, very similar to that in that you really need to focus on that and always be improving that. And, and that is a solution uh, for, uh, for some of the, um, of the volume swings that we've seen. Um, so what are the pre prerequisites of, of these solutions? Well, uh, and I'm going to let Rajiv uh, build on this a little bit toward the end. Um, the simplification uh, of the process is really, really important. Um, and to be able to get scale and efficiency, you really have to break down those complex tasks that we have in the business, in the manufacturing process, in the manufacturing of loans. And you, you need to break those down into simple tasks that are understandable and manageable. Um, and the standardization comes next, where you're building a process flow to help streamline those tasks. Um, and then you need a real clear scope of what that is so that the teams that are handling those tasks are not overlapping. They're not doing the same thing. Uh, we don't have teams doing the same thing in a loan setup as we do in a pre-processing or a processing area. Uh, that you don't have the same teams doing the, or teams doing the same thing in a uh, pre-closing quality control as you might have in getting the loan ready to uh, to get in a closing queue. Uh, Rajiv, I'll ask you to to uh, weigh in here and and uh, uh, expand on that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, talking about simplification, it's really all about how could you take a complex process and break it down into smaller pieces to make it simpler task. I mean, it could be a multiple task. Um, you know, so for example, you take your loan processing. If you have a single processor involved in the file from beginning to the end, there's a lot for that person to take care of. There's a lot for that person to keep a track of. Now, obviously, when you have that type of process, scaling it becomes very difficult because then the only way to uh, scale that uh, operation would be for you to hire another experienced loan processor, which in the current market, all, you know, we all know very well how easy that could be, uh, especially when all your competitors are hiring as well. So what if you were able to break that complex loan processing task into smaller pieces, and then you had you could basically easily have resources that could be onboarded and trained on doing those tasks. Same goes for standardization. Now, I, when we work with a lot of bigger lenders, of course, most of them have standardized their processes, but especially with smaller lenders, uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of specific scenarios that are handled in a specific ways. And while those are good for great customer service to the borrower, as well as to the loan officer, in a long term, as you scale your organizations, those could definitely become bottlenecks. So even if you want to service somebody in a specific way, try to separate that out from your maybe general population of loans. So the general population of loans, there should be very clear standardized process about how something comes into the workflow and goes out of the workflow. And, and demarcation- Rajiv, is Rajiv if, if I can interrupt, sorry. I, I wanna give a, a, a real time example of that. We work with a, uh, a client uh, that lends, I think they're in about 35 states and um, they have branches that do things differently. Right. Um, whether it's a centralized processing for some branches, some branches have their own processing. Um, where this has become key for them is they've been able to show um, their branches how that standardization and building a uh, an end to end kind of process flow that really works uh, for them also works very well for the corporation, for the firm uh, that these branches um, are, are part of. It allows them to then standardize on all the back office work that they do uh, when loans come in for warehousing and funding uh, and closing and, um, and then for sale in the secondary market. So they've used this standardization idea to bring branches into the fold of as they grow, as they get bigger, um, as Raj said, for those larger organizations who already have those standardized processes, this has been, let me show you how and why this works. Um, and that's a real time example of, of what we've helped a client do. Raj? 
Yeah, absolutely. And and one one more point I want to add there uh, with regards to simplification and standardization is, in, in a lot of cases, we feel it's impossible to break things down. It's impossible for us to build a checklist. It's impossible for us to really have somebody come in and work out of um, a process document that you build. And, and that's where, uh, you know, I read a book uh, years ago um, and the book is called uh, The Checklist Manifesto. Uh, it's a book that you might wanna check in if, if you're looking into scalability. Uh, it's by the author Atul uh, Gawande and uh, the book was published a few years ago, but essentially it talks about how you could actually take a very complex process as, as you know, things related to healthcare, things related to aeronautics and so on. And you can still build checklists that can actually help you do things right and help you simplify those things as well. Let's move on to let's the next about, slide, Rob. Let's talk about demarcation, uh, Rajiv, uh, real quick. Well, yes, demarcation, um, one of the things that I have noticed, especially when you have teams, uh, cross-functional teams, or teams that are having similar responsibilities, oftentimes it results in people doing a duplicate, a duplication of uh, duties. So you might have the same document being checked by, for example, loan setup team, but then the processor might be checking for the same as well. Uh, you know, the, the closure might be checking for the same as well. Now, if you had built a process which clearly demarcated that it is the responsibility of the loan setup personnel to make sure all the disclosures are signed, for example, there's no reason for everybody else in the process that comes after the loan setup personnel to check for the same signature, to, to look for the same document. And imagine the amount of time and effort that could save you. And, and that's what efficiency is all about. Great points, Raj. Thank you. So let's let's move into um, what we think helps the scalability and the efficiency of organizations um, in our world. Um, and let's talk about what you can expect um, if you if you have a strategy in place uh, to take a portion of your business and start outsourcing. So first of all, um, a wider talent pool. Uh, clearly, you know, we, we can beat this one up, but we have limited resources here in the United States for mortgage talent. Um, invariably, if you want to bring someone in, you either have to pay up for them uh, or you have to, uh, you know, have a, a really good training uh, program uh, that can get them in production and really working uh, very quickly. Um, where, where we have our operations in um, two locations in India, in Bangalore and Punai, and in, um, uh, in, in uh, the Philippines, we have a, a huge talent pool um, and very well-educated talent pool. Um, so we, we offer a wider talent pool in which to draw people. Um, you can also expect very consistent results. Uh, so wh what we like to say is, uh, if, you, if you give us a task, if we're doing a process for you, you tell us exactly what your expectations are, that's exactly what the output will be. Uh, if you tell us to move you know, this, this cup from, from, from point A to point B, that's exactly what you will get. Um, a little bit of a plug, unlike uh, some of our competitors, uh, our teams work for only one client, uh, only one client. They're your team members and, and you'll work with them consistently and get consistent results it then produces that highly scalable operation uh, for you. You know, one of the other points that we like to make is that with uh, utilizing outsourcing and, and in particular Flat World, we provide uh, project managers, supervisors um, and team leads uh, at no additional cost. In other words, the people that run the teams that work for you um, are, are really your managers and they are they allow you and your managers on shore and in your firms uh, to have an expanded managerial bandwidth. They do not have to babysit employees. They do not have to um, oversee these employees on a daily basis. That's all done by us. Um, I think um, the, the cost savings that outsourcing provides is a proven commodity. I don't think there's any, um, uh, uh, in, any misses there. I think, um, you know, we, we guarantee a 50% cost savings on your, on your current uh, workforce. And, you know, something else that I really want to uh, import on you, 
Yeah. Oftentimes people view outsourcing, whether it's onshore or offshore, um, as taking people's jobs away within the firm. And, and actually we've seen quite the opposite. It actually helps secure jobs. Um, most of our clients or many of our clients, and, and uh, if you talk to them, you'll find out, they utilize their employees as they're freed up or as the uh, excess volume is taken up for client facing activities. Uh, which creates a higher service level, creates a, uh, a tremendous bond with the, with the, uh, with the borrower and the, and the customer, whether it's correspondent or wholesale, the broker or the lender, uh, creates a great bond with the, the firm's employees. And it also uh, can, can give a more enlightened career path to some of your employees that are, that are um, you know, really excellent workers. Um, finally, because we work with so many lenders and because of the arrangements we have with supervisors and team leads managing a few teams, they get to see what's going on with other lenders, with other customers, and they get to identify best practices and in many cases make recommendations. Um, around those best best practices, um, you know what what they see working somewhere else. Uh, if they're on the same LOS, perhaps uh, help uh, with a process improvement with our customers because they have this expanded view uh, with a number of of clients, and that runs all the way up uh, the food chain here at Flat World uh, as we work with many clients. Um, Rajiv, anything to add there? Yeah, definitely, uh, especially an example on the industry best practices. Uh, we, had, uh, we had a case with uh, one of our clients a couple of years ago uh, who actually paid a consultant to come and do consulting for them. And basically consultant's job was to streamline their processes to some degree and, and bring any best practices that the consultant was aware of. And I think they spend tens of thousands of dollars trying to do and do that and go through that process. Um, the customer presented the same problem to, to us. Uh, obviously, we had a team of people doing work for them. We didn't charge them anything extra uh, for the consulting part of it. But because of the experience and the knowledge that we had of how there were several other mortgage lenders using the exact same loan origination system, uh, in a very similar type of origination model, we were able to recommend best practices, which improved things for them significantly. And they didn't have to pay a penny to us because it was part of the value add that we brought to the table. So there's definitely a lot more to expect from outsourcing than just saying, oh, it's just gonna be cheap labor or less expensive resource. I mean, just think about the, the, the chances and, or the opportunity for you to present an operational problem to people who are outside of your immediate team members, right? So you have five managers handling five different departments, but think about you have these two extra people now who you can come to and present a problem and those people will work on solving your problems, right? That's expanded managerial bandwidth. That's basically a value add out of nowhere, uh, which you may or may not be actually expecting out of outsourcing. So there's definitely a lot to think about um, in terms of value that outsourcing brings to the table um, than just you know cost savings. That, that's a great example, Rajiv, and I have a more, even more recent with a new client um, started about two months ago. <clears throat> they actually sent us their workflows, their process flow, their, um, excuse me, um, how, how, they, how they operated and asked us to re-engineer the entire thing. And as Raj said, we did that at no cost, re-engineered their process, you know, back to the processors bandwidth that Rajiv referred to earlier. They had processors that were managing 50 to 60 loans in a month and they were absolutely beside themselves. They just couldn't handle it. Um, and their service was, was suffering tremendously. We broke it down into little pieces. We worked with them on their process flow. We helped them re-engineer it. And uh, they're very, very happy with the results. Their employees are, are, are happier. Uh, the loans are going much smoother. The borrowers, the clients are much happier. Um, and and that's a, those are two real world examples. Okay, go to the next slide. So what are some of the prerequisites if you wanted to begin outsourcing? And, and again, as I said, folks, we're gonna stop after the outsourcing piece and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it open for some time for some questions. But first of all, it needs a commitment from all levels of the organization. 
Um, it has to be a strategy that your firm employs. Um, so I, I've spent, uh, I was uh, 10 years with GE Capital. I spent a long time at Chase um, and I spent um, a long time at, at Freedom. And I'll, I'll give you three distinct examples. At, at GE, uh, they were way ahead of outsourcing. Uh, at Chase, we actually had, um, and, and if you would go to Bangalore, you would see this, you would see Wells and Chase and Bank of America, you'd see big firms that have their own uh, outsourcing operations in India. Um, and at Chase, we had um, uh, our operation for correspondent lending in, in uh, the Philippines, and it made all the difference in the world. But we had a commitment from the top, um, and that commitment flowed up and down because we saw the value. Uh, when I, um, a few ex-Chase uh, folks and I joined Freedom to stand up their correspondent division, uh, we did the same thing. Uh, one of our core strategies was scalability. And how do we scale? We utilize outsourcing. Um, that was the way we were scaling our operation. And, and we do um, a ton of business with, with Freedom right now at all different levels in all of their three different or four different channels of business, retail, call center, wholesale, and correspondent. Uh, and it's because they recognize the value of outsourcing. They recognize and understand uh, the different um, uh, you know, volume swings that we face. Um, and uh, you know, th they're looking at unprecedented volumes because they've been ahead of this and have that as a strategic initiative and commitments from all levels of the organization. Um, there, there does need to be periodic uh, leadership oversight, especially at the early stages. That is a prerequisite. Um, I tell new clients all the time and, and folks that I'm talking to, we need to really communicate very effectively at the beginning. Um, we need your commitment on that. In fact, um, if you were to look at our roadmap for working um, uh, with us, you will see in, in, in various different slides, you will see us reinforcing um, that we want your commitment to communicate with us. Very, very important. You know, a designated champion, I don't care what you're doing, always helps a cause. Um, I, I don't think that needs a whole lot of explanation. Um, and then, you know, you have to really be committed to that standardization and to break those tasks off, as Rajiv has spoken about before. Yeah, I think I'd like to add on the designated sure. champion part a little bit. Um, again, when you think about a designated champion, it doesn't necessarily need to be someone's full-time job, right? So you may not need to hire another manager who's responsible for everything outsourcing. It could actually be um, you know, done by all the existing managers that you have, that they work with us. But then one of them, either somebody in the, uh, in the operations team, one of the managers, or it could be somebody from uh, the vendor management team, or it could be somebody in the senior management team. But there, basically there has to be somebody who's sort of responsible for making things work in, in an outsourcing relationship. Somebody that we could go to and say, here is what we need to be successful, right? Uh, and, and that person should have um, sort of either the answers we need or should be able to leverage other resources within the organization to give us the answer. That is critical really um, to, um, to the success of uh, outsourced relationships. And Rajiv, you hit on a couple of important points. It can be somewhere, anywhere in the organization. Um, and we have large clients that have vendor management teams, but they also have champions within their, uh, their respective um, uh, disciplines. Um, we have uh, a client that has actually um, uh, promoted someone to be the outsourcing manager uh, in order to implement the uh, strategic initiative that they, want to, uh, that they want to put in place around outsourcing. Um, so it can be at any level of the organization or several levels of the organization. It's a great point, Rajiv. Okay, so we're gonna stop here and let's see if we have any questions that we can answer. Um, I wanna do a, a time check with you, Tony, as well. It looks like um, we might have about 10 or 15 minutes left uh, to talk about Thanks. automation, but let's see if there's any questions. Um, well, yeah, there was one about, you know, you're, you spoke about the roadmap um, of working with uh, Flat World. So you know, how do you get started in outsourcing? You know, what, what are those steps? What does that look like? They just simply have to contact me, uh, Tony. That's pretty, <laughs> that's, pretty <laughs> just call that's, me. that's that's pretty <laughs> much it. Well, you know, again, I think you, I think you need a commitment uh, first and foremost. And, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let um, I'll let Rajiv handle this one. Um, 
for because he's he's uh, he's seen it all in his 12 years doing this. I'm I'm a rookie, so to speak. Well, I mean, outsourcing, when you hear about something like outsourcing, it sounds like a very daunting task and, and, and uh, something that would require a lot of time, effort, and attention. But actually, it's not. If, if you do it the right way and you got the right partner, it can actually be uh, set up and, and brought up to running in, in a matter of weeks. We're not even talking months here. We're talking days and weeks here. Um, the, the idea is obviously pick something which is easy for you to hand off to somebody else, right? And, and obviously handling your internal operation, you would know what are the tasks which are easier for me to hand off to somebody else. Pick that task, bring that to us, have a discussion. Our service agreements are pretty simple and easy. So it takes no time for legal team to really review those. Get that done. Within a matter of weeks, if not days, we can actually have a team up and running for you. Now, once you see how it works for you, obviously there's gonna be other ideas around what more can we do? How, what are the other tasks you can handle? And that's an ongoing process, but getting something up and running is a matter of days, if not weeks. Another important point around that is you can also look at where's your, your biggest bottleneck? Where are you having the most problems? And, and let us help you solve them. By the way, that roadmap actually kind of illustrates you know, the number of days we need, depending on the task and depending on the, um, uh, the, the process that you're having us look at, um, it'll, it'll outline exactly how long it will take. And, and Raj is, is right. It, it, it will make it pretty easy and simple for you. Well, and you know, the follow-up question that was time and effort. So I think you guys have, uh, have definitely- Tony, we can't hear you. Very well. Can you not hear me? Yeah, your I, audio I, is very low, Tony. We yeah, can hear you, but I think I got the question, low. though, but it's very low. No, it was just time and effort uh, was the follow-up question. You know, how much time and effort would it take? And obviously, uh, you, you have answered that very effectively. Yeah, there is a, there's a question that I see in, um, in, in the chat box, and then might want to address that, too. So I think the question is all about... <laughs> how do we make it easy for people who are working remotely, right? I mean, there are people, uh, especially in you know, countries like India, Philippines, um, they're working remotely. Uh, not everybody may or may not have a good internet connection. So how do you help that? How do you solve that? And how do you help people have uh, a normal work time, uh, even though their internet might be slow or whatever. I, I, think, I think the right way to do that is through a VDI setup, a virtual desktop interface setup. And it's not just ap applicable for uh, outsourcing scenario. It could actually even help in your internal operation. If you have employees who are working remotely, uh, leverage the VDI setup. It, it, it's a little bit of a cost for you, but once you have that up and running, setting up a new system would be very easy. Um, the slow internet, even if an employee has a slower internet, would not hamper or impact their productivity because all the processing is happening within you know, these cloud servers, uh, which are very fast anyways. I, I can tell you uh, most of our larger clients, um, they all operate that way in the remote environment in the pandemic um, and have moved their, their workforce in that direction. Uh, VPNs are really not the preferred method anymore. It's really about the virtual desktop. Yeah, and there are multiple providers. I mean, you've got sure. you know, the Amazon Workspaces, you got Azure, you got Citrix, there are multiple providers. Pick the one you like, but at the end of the day, they all solve the same problem. Right, Rob, let's uh, move on to- Any other questions, Tony? Nothing? Okay, all right. Um, nope, not yet. Okay, um, so when we talk about technology and automation, um, people in our industry, I think not only are we slow to adapt, but a lot of people look at it differently and think about it differently. Um, and you know, when we think about third-party integration as an example, um, I think that a lot of that has been done, whether it's um, most likely a, a point of sale system. I think uh, Blend, 
uh, Maxwell and Simple Nexus, Tony, are, are the, uh, the partners in the TMC uh, that operate point of sale type technologies. But I think our industry has been very, very slow to, um, to integrate past um, uh, that point of sale. Um, but it, that has seemed to be the most accepted in our business. But when you get to the manufacturing process and the workflow automation, um, I think we've been a little bit slower to adapt to that. Um, Rajiv, you want to talk a little bit about uh, workflow automation? And I think all of you see this big sign here behind me, M Suite. Uh, we'll give a plug to our, our uh, automation product uh, uh, here toward the end. But uh, Rajiv, you want to talk a little bit about workflow automation and then, you know, exactly um, in its simplest, simplest form, how you can automate things going forward. Sure. So uh, if you look at this slide here, it's, it's, really just talking about an automation maturity curve for an organization. So the first thing for any organization to look at is, especially in the mortgage industry, because we deal with a lot of third-party vendors and there's a lot of documents and data coming uh, from one system to the other. I think that third-party integration is, is very, very important. Now, those are applicable for you know, your title vendors, your appraisal vendors, your flood cert vendors, like all the vendors that you have working with, instead of sending a request outside of your current LOS system, how about if you were able to integrate all of that within the LOS? So with a click of a button, you could order appraisal. With a click of a button, you could order title. With a, cl a click of a button, you could you know, request other types of uh, information from third parties. That would be amazing. And that's something that I've seen a lot of companies do but there are still pretty significant number of lenders uh, who have not been able to do that. So that's like a, you know, really starting point for you when you think about technology and automation. The second one is the workflow automation and the workflow automation really refers to specific things within the workflow um, from disclosure to post-closing. And, and uh, you know, as Rob mentioned, I've, I've pretty much been part of, all the client engagement here at Flatworld. And with that, I've, I've had the opportunity to see different workflows, see different systems uh, for uh, 70 plus customers that we serve today. And what I'm seeing in a lot of those cases is you have the same data being input by one team on screen one and the other team on screen two. Why? Because the data from screen one is not being able to transition to screen two. Again, that's a very basic example that I gave you, but there are many such examples where you can actually help your existing team be more efficient only if you had structured the workflow in the right way. And the structuring the workflow could go all the way from how can you transition and transfer data from one place to the other to how can you design those screens within the LOS to be more uh, user-friendly and, and more effective um, to even to a point, how do you hand off work from one team to the other in a smoother fashion? So there's not a lot of email and you know back and forth happening to know what's happening on a file. So all of that is part of workflow automation, and that's definitely something that every lender should be thinking about. But the third and and the last one, which is probably the highest maturity curve from an automation perspective, is what if you were able to take a specific task within your origination process and get that fully automated. For example, uh, one of the tasks that every lender spends, you know, hours on um, is, is document indexing. Now you have these documents coming from different sources. And today in, in many cases, most lenders just have uh, a person looking at those documents, splitting those documents and placing them where they need to go within the LOS so others uh, can fetch those documents easily. Why do we have that kind of task being done by a human being in 2020 when we got AI and ML and all these fancy technologies out there that could potentially automate it, which is where uh, Rob was pointing out to M-Suite. Uh, you know, we, we built that product because we saw there was a lot of those manual effort, which could actually be automated to give more efficiency and more scalability to our clients. So we've been able to automate things like document indexing, things like if you have a document coming from a third party, you can extract various data points from that document, 
and place them in um, you know different placeholders within um, within your LOS, as well as even the ability for you to compare data points. The data points could be compared uh, between two documents or from data that is available on a document to the data point that you have within the LOS system. Today, in most organizations, you have human beings do that, but all of that is possible to be automated with the latest technology that is available. And M Suite is definitely a product that addresses that. And, and Raj, you left off one important point. With more accuracy uh, than uh, than even a, you know a human uh, a human system, someone doing yeah, that. Yeah. Much more accurate. I think we've got a slide coming on that, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> Where we um, actually do delve into the details of that. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. What, what yes. happened there? There we go. Yeah, so this is where, uh, this is what- This Rob is where the rubber meets the road. Exactly, exactly. You know, so we talked about automation. We, we talked about uh, outsourcing, saving cost. And, and the benefits of outsourcing. Now, these are some of the benefits that you can get with automation. I mean, uh, first of all, you're able to take um, what is uh, you know, a fixed cost from an employee perspective. You have a full-time employee doing a task for you and whether you give them 10 files or 15 files a month, uh, you know, it costs you the same. Uh, how about you were able to convert that into a fully variable cost? So now you're paying for transaction uh, instead of uh, paying people. Um, that is really helpful for an industry like mortgage because we know our volumes go up and down pretty much, um, even during the year, let alone with uh, special effects of corona and interest rate scenario. But then it also reduces turnaround times. And if you were doing document indexing and data extraction with human beings, they can only go one file at a time. And basically that would mean you know, if you got a few files all together, the last one might be done after several hours. Now with automation, this could happen 24 seven. So as soon as something comes in, you know, a, a tool like M Suite can index those documents immediately, extract the data from those documents immediately. Think about how that would help you in reducing your closing cycle, right? The time that you spend from disclosure to closing alone, think about how much that could be condensed. And obviously it becomes more scalable because you know if you went from 500 loans to 5,000 loans, you don't have to hire a whole bunch of people and you don't have to hire and train all those people. You could basically say, well, here is my volume and a tool like M Suite would basically be able to handle that expanded capacity in a matter of days. So you don't need to worry about scalability there. And obviously it's consistent now with human uh, doing document indexing or data extraction. We all know very well there is a potential of somebody uh, mislabeling a document or there's a potential of somebody uh, making a typo as they were entering data. All of those you know, small errors could really cost us a lot at times. And think about it, being able to take all of those out of the equation because the system doesn't make those mistakes for sure. And, and for sure there is you know, further cost saving. Like if, if you were looking at outsourcing and that saves your cost by maybe say 50%, with automation, you could save it up to 70%. So it, it, it is even more uh, beneficial than outsourcing from a cost standpoint. You know, one, one other word about automation. Um, it, it, it can seem daunting to try to automate uh, your, your, your manufacturing process. It's really not, but it really takes a partner uh, that's able to come in and con consult with you on what you want to achieve, how quickly you want to achieve it, and uh, really give you a kind of a roadmap, I'll use that word again, on how to automate. Um, one of the advantages of M Suite is it's not a software, it's not licensing, we're not trying to sell you something. It's, it's automation as a service. Um, and it can be as uh, the scope can be as narrow or wide as you want to make it. It can, it can go from narrow to wide uh, in a very short time period as, as you see the value in it. So um, if someone says they can come in and automate everything like that, sorry, it's not going to happen. It, it takes some work um, and it takes, uh, it takes a good partner to, to make it happen. Um, 
to continue the shameless plug, Tony, sorry. And I know we're, uh, we're bumping up against uh, time. I'll leave this slide with you guys. So we do currently have 21 uh, TMC clients that we work with, um, over 70 clients uh, here in the United States, 1,800 team members. Uh, this is just the volume of funds, uh, fund fundable loans that we support. Uh, our, our 70 plus clients uh, probably do a, a bit more business than that, but it's a uh, pretty good numbers. I won't spend a lot of time on this slide. Um, so we'll, we'll conclude and then open it up for any other questions. Tony, I think we're, we're at the time we need to be. Um, yeah, I'll let you guys read this, but this is the way to get a scalable and uh, or this, these are some, some uh, helpful points on getting a, a scalable and efficient operation. We can help through outsourcing. Uh, and automation. And it's it's essential in the kinds of market that we're working in now, both on the upside and the downside in the lending uh, business. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Tony and see if we have any more questions. We did just have a question come in. Um, when we have different clients with different platforms, what is our approach automating the similar process going to be then? Is it possible to apply the same automation technology to different platforms? Yeah, I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, basically, uh, you know, automation is, is built in, uh, you know, there are different architecture and structure to how you can build an automation tool. And uh, what we have done with M-Suite is we have structured it in such a way that it can handle different workflows, it can handle different LOS systems that it can connect with, and it can also handle different scenarios. So for example, uh, as of today, there is a lot of information that we uh, as lenders receive are in documents. So we ask title um, uh, companies to give us title report. We ask appraisal companies to give us appraisal document. So most of the information, pay stops, W-2s, bank statements, like a lot of those information is still coming as a part of document. So we do have an OCR built into the system that is able to extract data from those documents and then be able to run all the other, you know, intelligent automation at the back of it to recognize what does data point mean uh, and, and what that uh, data point need to go to the LOS. Now think about a scenario uh, in future where all of that information may not come as a document, but just come as an XML feed, just come as a digital you know, version of the document, which is basically just a data point. Uh, M Suite is capable of switching from extracting information from a document to be able to listening to a data point, which is coming in a digital format, um, just like that. I mean, there, there is no extra effort that the lender would have to think about uh, as they make that change. Um, yeah. With regards to integration with LOSs, it's only about APIs uh, that, that we connect with. So uh, if, even if you move from one LOS to the other, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna disconnect M Suite from the connection that we had with this LOS and connect it back to the other LOS. It's pretty seamless, pretty easy, and, and it works phenomenally. And instantaneous, yeah. We have, we have a number of use cases around uh, what Raj has illustrated, uh, whether it's uh, retail, wholesaler, correspondent. Excellent, Tony? thanks so much. Can you get, I wanna speak up so you can hear me okay. Please. Um, how about protecting data? How is that handled? It's a great question, and when we when we get all the time, um, we we have all the appropriate uh, SOC certifications. Uh, we go through several different audits, um, and um, when you're working through the virtual desktop uh, or VPN, um, you can rest assured that that data is protected. Um, Raj, if you want to give any more specifics um, uh, around that, please do. I, I just, Tony, I just want to be um, cognizant of the time. Yep. Um, that you've given us. Looks like we have about two more minutes. That's what so, I thought. Yeah. Go ahead, Reggie. Yes, I think I could just add a few more points. Uh, basically, with regards to data security, uh, our um, delivery centers, the service delivery centers or offices, as you can call them, uh, they're highly secure. Uh, and, and I've heard that from 
uh, all the customers who have tried to come here for a visit or an audit, and they're all shocked and awe about what they see uh, because of the kind of uh, security measures that we take. Uh, for example, um, our, our offices always have a uh, manual security personnel 24 seven. So no matter what time of the day you come, there is somebody uh, security guard right in front of the door, uh, checking who's coming in, checking who's going out. Uh, the access to the operations floor is always through a biometric. So you can't fake your identity and get in uh, even if you wanted to. Um, even if you carry a cell phone or personal belonging, all of that needs to be stored in a locker which is designated for a different employees. So uh, you can't really bring in your cell phone to the work area or a thumb drive or anything. So, and, 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 and the entire operation floor is absolutely paperless. And, and when I say paperless, I literally mean paperless because there is no printer available. There's not a single piece of paper that is available there. So if you look at it, there is no way for anybody to, um, get in to the office and do something or connect with a network because that our network basically doesn't have any uh, ports for people to connect to. So at the end of the day, I think the only risk as far as data security is concerned is somebody memorizing a bunch of thing and going, <laughs> that, <laughs> that obviously is not something that you would describe as a risk from a data security uh, standpoint. Yeah, there's no- and, and uh, Everything there's... I mentioned, everything I mentioned has been certified by third-party auditors, as well as certified by our clients, because we've been audited n number of times by different banks and mortgage lenders that we serve. Yeah, yeah there's no access to social media in that office. Uh, there's no, you know, calling calling uh, folks from the office. It's it's pretty tight. Not even Google.com. Like you <laughs> right. can't even go to Google. Whitelisted, All white the websites, websites, websites are websites. blocked, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, thank you all so much. We. Um, I that's all the questions that we had for today. If you've got any further questions um, that you think of as soon as we hang up, because that always happens to me, um, <laughs> we will provide you with uh, follow-up information so that you can contact uh, Rob or Rajiv um, directly. Uh, so know that you will get a follow-up email tomorrow, as we mentioned before. Um, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rajiv. We really do appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Um, thank you to the attendees who have uh, joined us today. We know that uh, things are crazy busy in this uh, pandemic world that we're living in, and we really appreciate you all being here. And uh, please come back to TMC Connect, and uh, we will continue to share all of the information that you guys bring to us. We'll continue to listen and provide you with, uh, with expert content, content. So we appreciate it. Thank you very much, and everybody have a great day. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, guys. Very much. Tony.